This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. Subscribe to Bloomberg Surveillance On Demand on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And always on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Jared Cassidy uh, joins us. Uh, he's a large cap bank analyst at RBC Capital Markets with decades of experience. What will the cost reductions be, uh, Gerard? I mean, I mean, I get they're going to come out and they're going to manage that, but is 2024 beginnings with this earnings report a year of cost reductions for these major banks? Tom, I think there will be an increased focus on reducing costs, no doubt about it. The banks are striving for positive operating leverage. And as you know, the net interest revenue numbers will start the year off on the weak side because of the margin pressure that the banks are experiencing. We expect that to inflect, though, sometime in the first or second quarter of 24. But to your point, we do expect to see further announcements of downsizing of personnel. We've already had some announcements, right. as you know. PNC is an example. Of course, Citigroup's got a big restructuring going on. So, yes, Tom, I, we do expect to hear more about reducing costs. It's a good Friday, folks. I zelled in offspring. Gerard Cassidy knows Zell works. How's the digital banking battle? Who is winning the digital bank wars? Tom, all of the major banks have incredibly good digital products. You know, when you think about the introduction of the iPhone back in, I think it was 07, 08, it really has transformed banking like so many other industries around the world, especially on the consumer banking side. But as we know, you can buy a very um, strong product off the shelf, which allows the smaller community banks to compete against the likes of Bank America and JP Morgan with the digital product. And probably, as you know from your own personal experience, there's a, only a handful of app or uh, transactions we do on a phone. So you don't need all the bells and whistles. It's like the old VHS machines, Tom. We only use them to play um, tapes and maybe record, even though they had all those other bells and whistles on it. Such Same thing with digital apps. He's, he busted my jobs. Just he, a little bit. He knows you have no clue what we're talking about. I remember VHS, Tom. I was around for VHS. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's good. Sure. JP Morgan and, on, and Bank of America just around the corner. Before we get there, Gerard, let's talk about how to navigate these numbers from B of A, the one-time items you're anticipating, how to really get a sense of the underlying business, the strength of the underlying business, what we look for. That's that's true, John. We're going to obviously, you know, exclude the one-time items. Um, everybody's going to have the big FDIC charge, you might recall, uh, from what happened last spring with the failures. So that's a one-time item that the banks will incur. But it's really going to come down to the core numbers, and that's going to really focus on two areas, the net interest revenue growth and fee revenue growth. And in, within the fee revenue growth, of course, with the big universal banks, we're going to be very focused on the capital markets numbers, especially for read-throughs for next week when Goldman and Morgan Stanley report. IB's been really soft. You know that, Jared. I'm just wondering where the pie hasn't been getting bigger. Which bank has been getting a bigger slice of that pie? How are they outperforming it's relative to other banks? Who's winning? Yeah, it appears that Bank America is showing the best improvement of taking a bigger piece of the pie. Um, it, it's somewhat difficult on the trading side to really get a good handle on who's got the better market shares. The geologic numbers help us on the investment banking side because those are publicly reported numbers and those are good estimates that geologic has. And in that area, the, the dominant players, of course, are right. Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and so we'll see if... Bank America or City can creep up in their market share uh, in that area as well. Gerard, are you going to undersell their success here? I always, it's not a joke, folks. I'm serious about it when I say they almost have to apologize for their concentration and their success down the income statement. Is it the same old, same old this time around with these four reporting? I would say that. Um, they're going to, they are going to be uh, very straightforward about the efforts that they're doing, the, the success that they're having, but also pointing out, Tom, that they're not only making money for their shareholders, but they're really investing in their communities. You know, the banking industry never really receives any credit for the amount of volunteer hours and money that's invested that they donate. 
to communities around this country. And so it's a win for everybody when these banks produce strong numbers, and they have been producing uh, strong numbers, these big four banks. And I expect today we'll, we'll see some really impressive numbers. Jared, I, I, I believe this, and I've, I've said this from the day I walked in the door here at Bloomberg. We don't understand how big these people are. I just added up an approximation of how many people they have some together, these four banks, are 989,000-plus employees. A lot of that's retail banking. Where's that statistic in five years? I, it's going to be interesting. I think that number, depending on how well they can grow, will probably be flattened down because of the... It expectation over the next five years of increased use of artificial intelligence to really make the banks more efficient and more profitable. But nobody should expect those numbers to be down 20 or 30 percent because of new technologies. These companies, it's a people business, Tom, as you well know. Financial services is generally a high touch business in many areas. There is opportunities for digital banking as we as we know, but it's not a total el elimination of the human touch, which is an important part of banking. Jared, stay close. Sit tight. We've got some numbers in just a moment from Bank of America and JP Morgan, Wells Fargo City, all coming up later this morning. Going into it, if you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Equity futures on the S&P 500, just slightly negative. We're down by 0.2%. The tension in the Middle East continues to build. Crude is up by more than 4%, $75 on WTI. On Brent crude, we are in the 80s, $80 and about 70 cents. With us around the table to break down these numbers, I'm pleased to say, is Bloomberg Shanali Basak. Shanali, four big banks four different stories. What are you looking for? What is going to turn around the story for Bank of America, I think, is an interesting question. We started there. Can you imagine, John, that Capital One last year was up 42 percent and Bank of America only up 2 percent? Because people are borrowing on their credit cards. If you think about it, on one hand, it's that strict balance between being able to borrow and being able to not lose money on those loans. OK, but to be careful here, Moynihan has to come out today. Does he have to address not concerns or fears, that overdoes it, but just a study of Bank of America's liquidity and insolvency position. Well, he does not because Bank of America has really taken care of that problem over the last decade, haven't they? And, mm -hmm. you know, you could make an argument that investors maybe want Bank of America to take on more risk. Right. Remember, they have piled a lot of their balance sheet into bonds when yields were next to nothing. And so they have had that money tied up. <clears throat> that balance sheet is starting to roll off quite a bit, and you're starting to see they're held to maturity losses starting to shrink as well uh -huh. as rates rise so the or rates come down rather so they want them to put that money to work uh, remember their average FICO score is higher than some of these riskier borrowers here but does that mean they want them to lend harder I think that this is a balance question of the banks especially as uh -huh. delinquencies start to rise on credit cards how much risk are you really willing to take on as a bank today will be all love and kisses what happens in February do we see a lot of right sizing and rationing do we see announcements or is it dribs and drabs through the late winter? We've been talking about this, the culling. We have seen stricter the, the culling. cullings, right, um, at the end of last year. Look at the media, too. You know. Brutal. It is, yeah. it is brutal. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely brutal. And remember, we saw so many job cuts last year. The hope this year is that things start to turn around and they can keep more people on staff. To Gerard Cassidy's point here, you did see Bank of America gain a little share in investment banking. And they also bank in the middle market, where a lot of banks don't have that wide. American footprint and deals happen faster when they're less than $10 billion. We've been talking about banks for the last 15 minutes, haven't mentioned last spring. Have we left that all behind now, the bank failures of nine months ago? Uh, yes. I mean, no in the sense that you are going to see those FDIC charges, but the idea of the severe crisis that people felt back in March, <clears throat> they don't feel that now. But we do see, see pain still, and you'll see that in places like commercial real estate. By the way, you'll also see it in places like auto and credit cards that could get messy in the coming quarters as we see right. from Fed studies that delinquencies are rising. They all come out with their different PowerPoints. What's the first thing you look for? I mean, like 42 pages, let's say. What's the first thing Shanali Bassett goes to? I go to, you and I both do this, we go to the returns. At the end of the day, it comes down to the returns on tangible common equity. It comes down to the returns on equity. It's the best clean way to gauge the banks, but the profitability. And it's basically, except for Citigroup, big double digit, right? Is that a for generalization? For J.P. Morgan. Every Everybody else okay. is wavering against that 
double digit number and it comes down to the costs as well. Uh, those returns can't be gauged if you can't keep your costs under control. Interestingly enough, Bank of America had made that great move to increase their minimum wage to $25 per person in the next year or so in the next couple of years. So they do have a cost base, uh, a big employee base that they have to contend to while also managing how to bring in more net interest income at a time where people are over extended on loans. I don't think we've ever done this, John. It's 6.44 Wall Street time, and we're waiting for four separate button pushes at 6.45. This <laughs> is unfair. Is this, I don't like Whose fault is this? this? Whose fault is it? I remember that time Bank of America came out at 5.45 in the morning. <laughs> But Gerard Cassidy remembers when there's carrier pigeons. I mean, you know, the pigeon, That's the, how they bird, used to deliver the, the bird would fly up from New York to Boston, and he'd be at Tucker Anthony Back in the days with, of the VHS. Out, with a big net out the window to capture the bird. We'll be drowning in these numbers in the next five, ten minutes, Shanali, just quickly, briefly. What do you make of that BlackRock deal this morning? BlackRock has been struggling to grow its alternatives business, and to do it in infrastructure is the one place it makes the most sense. If you think about um, their competition now, it's Brookfield. And you will wonder if they will dig deeper into those other alternatives like private credit that would, you've seen others really dive into. Would you suggest, uh, we're going to be very careful here with the time of folks. We'll give you the banks the moment they come out. John will do that. I'm fascinated with if this was a bidding war. I mean, <laughs> Gatwick, Suez Canal, whatever it is, there's different there. And, and, and the basic idea to me is Everybody else must have been bidding as well, right? These alternative asset managers, when I talk to folks in the market, they're all up for sale. <laughs> everybody is up. Everyone is Is that looking. because now money costs something and everybody's for sale, right? And scale matters. Unfortunately, okay. scale matters. So if you're not big enough, then you're not invited to the party. <laughs> the <laughs> push days. into private markets has been absolutely phenomenal. I want to bring back in Gerard Cassidy of RBC as we wait for these numbers from JP Morgan and Bank of America. Gerard, the competition, private markets, deep banking <laughs> these guys starting to eat the lunch of some of these big banks on Wall Street? I, I would say, John, they certainly have increased their competitive positions because many of the big banks that are regulated by the Federal Reserve, the controller of the currency, they've been de-risked. Following the financial crisis, as we all know, um, the Fed made a push to de-risk the large banks and that's what's happening. But all in all, the shadow banking industry has been around, as we all know, for 40 years. And it has taken over a very large position of providing financing for companies in this country. It has intensified more recently, as you pointed out, John. And so the banks are competitive, but the private side has certainly taken a leg up more recently. Hey, Gerard, the numbers drop for B of A. Let's get to those numbers. There's a couple of one-time items in here that you need to strip out to really gauge the underlying business. She's only getting a fuller picture of what's dropping. The stock is right now. We're down by 5%. They missed on a lot of um, critical figures here, going down to the core items here. For example, in trading, where you've seen them really punch above their weight, they did come in below estimates on fixed income as well as total sales and trading revenue. Importantly, also, they came in below estimates on net interest income. This is what we've been talking about, their ability to bring in loan lending money at the time when you do see consumers still borrowing. Are people going to slow down their borrowing activity if they feel overextended? The outlook for that is really really important here as we wait uh, for further communication from executives here. Provision for credit losses, while that came in below estimates, John, you did see charge-offs come in above estimates, which means loans are starting to sour just a little bit more than Wall Street expects. Yeah, the statement comes out, John, and is a generalization here, and Shanali and Gerard are the pros on this. Return on average tangible common equity goes from a 15-ish to 13 for Bank of America. So there's that key ratio ebbing away a little bit. Wells Fargo coming out as well, but let's just sit on the trading numbers out of Bank of America. Just for a beat, Shanali, 4Q trading revenue, as you pointed out, 3.75 billion, the estimate 3.84. Fig trading, can break it down from fig trading to equities trading. Fig trading coming in at 2.21 billion, the estimate 2.4. Equities at 1.55, the estimate 1.4. Four, four. What would you read into that right now? Uh, they had zero days of trading losses. On one hand, that is great for a bank. On the other hand, remember, prime services, the ability to service asset managers and hedge funds, super competitive. Goldman has been trying to eat away at everyone's share. Uh, and so <coughs> watching into next week how trading falls across the pack will uh, be important. How much risk are you willing to take on in this volatile market is the question for these banks. Sally, global markets, Bank of America, zero trading loss days in 2023 
Is that good or bad? I mean, I mean, I guess they're bragging about that, but does that really mean they took no risk on their desk? It, it is a good thing. You don't want to see these banks losing much money. Uh, but to your point here, at this point in time, can you afford to lose a little bit of money? That is a big question here. Uh, it, it's a tough, tough balance. You have to remember, we're living in a time where non-bank market makers are gaining a lot of share. Look at those Jane Street numbers, for example. Citadel Securities, we don't know what they look like full year. And and remember, guys, trading activity bounced back at the end of last year. And so uh, Bank of America's competitive positioning, we have to wait for everybody else's numbers. But you want to see if they are uh, kind of holding their ground against the big guys. More numbers. Wells Fargo, I promised you those just briefly. Four quarter revenue, 20.48 billion. The estimate, 20.35. Their stock is down by 2.6%. JP Morgan up next. We'll go through this piece by piece. 4Q Investment Banking revenue 1.58 billion the estimate 1.72 we talked about trading revenue over at bank of america let's do that at jp morgan as well equity sales and trading revenue 1.78 billion the estimate 1.93 fit comes in at 4.03 billion the estimate 3.84 there's a ton to get through here with jp morgan just the early stock reaction down four percent Shanali, what do you see yeah the the interesting thing here is investment banking is not jumping back as quickly as anybody expects remember even if deal making came back at the end of last year, you're not seeing the banks clip those, those fees yet from this activity. It takes a while for those fees to right. float in. Uh, remember, equities also below estimates. This is another competitive place on Wall Street today. Fees have been light the last couple of years, but that's a place that investors are expecting a bounce back as well. FIC came in above estimates, a whopping $4 billion. But is it enough to offset weakness elsewhere? We're keeping an eye on those provisions as well. Remember, uh, JP Morgan, at first glance, they're coming in above of estimates for the provisions, do they expect the environment yeah. to be weakening a little faster than investors expect? You're buried at the bottom of the very clear J.P. Morgan report. This is not CFA Institute work, John. Fortress principles. Book value up 16 percent. Tangible book value up 18 percent at Fortress Diamond. A bit of commentary from Jamie Diamond himself, the J.P. Morgan CEO. Rates may be higher than markets expect. Inflation may be stickier than markets expect. We've had these kind of warnings from Jamie Diamond over the last year or so. Gerard Cassidy has had a bit of time to go through these numbers. Tons of numbers, Gerard. Wows. Bank of America, JP Morgan, put it all together for us. What's the story? It's certainly complicated because of all the one-time charges as we touched on a moment ago. But what caught my attention already is that the credit quality picture for the banks was was strong in the quarter. For example, in Bank America, the provision for loan losses was less than expected, and the charge-offs, in, in our estimate, were a little better than what we were anticipating. And so I think that's one of the messages for investors. When you talk to investors, everybody's very concerned about the outlook for credit quality for the banks, and it looks like it's right. shaping up toward the end of the year to be pretty strong. But the investment banking results, capital market results, are coming in lighter than expected as you guys have pointed out. And Gerard, it's not the fine print, but it's on the edge of fine print. This is J.P. Morgan. Average deposits flat or down 3%, excluding their First Republic soiree. How do these banks react if yields come down and the money market fund wall migrates back to them? Tom, that's an interesting observation. The reintermediation back into the banks could certainly happen because, as you pointed out, the money market mutual funds, they're tied very tightly to the Fed funds rate. So if the Fed was to cut Fed funds this year, the money market mutual fund yields fall. The banks are a little slower to bring their yield down, so you could see that. But J.P. Morgan and the other big banks, as you know, are confronting quantitative tightening. Right. As, as we recall, under quantitative easing in the pandemic, we estimate that the Federal Reserve pumped four trillion dollars of deposits into the banking system, and now they're taking them out. And that's why yeah. you see some of these deposit numbers down. Let's bring James Gorman, retired into this from Morgan Stanley, Shanali Basic, with that important conversation recently. At J.P. Morgan Wealth Management, ROE, 
of 31 percent. That's the jewel of each of these banks. I mean, they they all want to be James Gorman, right? It's incredible what they're bringing in in terms of margins from these asset and wealth managers. And it is worth keeping an eye on. But again, Tom, if they can't make money at these other businesses, it does dampen the story for even the profitable parts of the business. We'll have Citigroup later in the hour. They're making tons of money at their treasury and trade services business, but markets, investment banking are lagging and credit quality, they're you know below Gerard's estimates, but they're broadly over the estimates of all Bloomberg um, estimates combined on average. And on cost, can you imagine? JP Morgan, which is among the best at cost control here for such a large bank, really able to keep a handle on their, um, their numbers here, on their re- returns, they're even above estimates here on non-interest expenses. So keeping these costs under control for the top four consumer banks is going to be a very interesting balance this year. We're down across the board on these four banks by a little more than 2%. Gerard, slightly unfair of me to ask this question, given you've only had about 24 minutes to look at some of the numbers. In fact, less than that. I think you've had about 15. Gerard, based on what you have seen, who won the quarter? I would say that um, it's it's hard to say, but um, J.P. Morgan's numbers uh, look pr- pretty darn good. Um, I'm interested to dive into the Wells Fargo numbers because they have been making real inroads into those trading and capital market areas that has been very beneficial to the fee revenue area. But overall, the important part, John, as we go through these numbers, is going to be what the outlook is for 2024. So I know we're going to focus on the earnings calls to hear what the guidance is for 2024. And if we are in for a soft landing and the Federal Reserve is finished in raising short-term interest rates, all four of these banks are going to be winners in 2024 as their business benefits from those types of conditions. Gerard, thank you, sir, for the anticipation of these numbers and the reaction to them this morning. Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets. Ken Ken Leon, he's tanned and rusted. Joins us right now, Director of Equity Research at CFRA. Ken, you've had some time to pour over the numbers. Good morning to you, sir. What stands out for you? Well, I think uh, first on bank stock prices, they're really consolidating after a big move in the fourth quarter. And looking out to 2024, it's not going to be a V-shape, if you will, strong recovery in any of the areas. But overall, what we're seeing is stability. And stability is going to lead to growth, Uh, loan growth. uh, Net interest income just doesn't fall off the cliff when rates are cut, uh, mostly because it's the spreads, as was talked about earlier. And I think overall, it's the inflection point in investment banking. Uh, Going into 2024, there is significant backlog, uh, particularly from the private equity firms, to monetize those investments into the market, uh, which would benefit the banks for investment banking for underwriting and M&A. Uh, additionally, banks are going to be conservative in their message with analysts today, uh, mostly because we expect to see tighter regulation by the end of this year. Uh, and you're going to hear the term both from banks and from analysts about capital build. That's going to be the clear message. And Ken Leon, Jane Frazier out later with 240,000 employees. I tried to add up the combined four bank employees and came up with over 900,000 employees between uh, the four. You've covered this for decades. Where's their employee account in five years? I mean, is this a shrinking business or do they just keep on, keep on going? Jane Fraser is doing a great job on a transformation, but for investors, transformation is a multi-year story with bumps. And I think for uh, what will be the headcount for a streamlined city group as we look at it two to three years out uh, is perhaps going to be 10 to 15 percent lower. There's a whole list of uh, businesses that are already announced as sold and consumer outside the U.S. Uh, so I think Uh, What Jane Fraser is looking for is execution. And I think by pre-announcing, if you will, those one-time chargers, they want to show what that runway is of this transformation. What is that runway? What will we learn in the hour from Jane Fraser? I think uh, what Jane Fraser is going to articulate is that City has some very durable businesses that 
have very reliable recurring revenue, whether it's in corporate or treasury services and payments. And then when they look at the other businesses where maybe they had only one eye on the business, they're going to reinvest in wealth management along with selective areas of investment banking. But this is going to be a streamlined bank looking out two to three years. Uh, I would say, though, uh, there will be bumps along the way. We had that same narrative with Wells Fargo. They're in a better po position today than a few years ago. So I think for Jane Fraser, it's just sh really showing that the strategy is beginning to work, but it's not going to be a turnaround uh, just in 2024. Ken Leon there of CFRA. Joining us now is Norman Rawl, Senior Advisor on the Transnational Threats Project at CSIS and former Senior U.S. Intelligence Official. Norman, good morning to you, sir. The first question from us this morning, overnight and through this morning, was that a strike on Houthi rebels or a strike against Iran? Good morning. Uh, the attack was a strike on Houthi rebels. It is a con attack consistent with the administration's uh, plan to have a gradual escalatory approach to the region. It certainly will degrade Houthi capabilities. Uh, it's unclear to the extent those capabilities will be degraded. It is unlikely to deter the Houthis from future attacks, although the Houthis will likely calibrate those attacks in discussion with Iran to prevent a more significant regime destabilizing response. Uh, Mr. Rule, Nicola Smith in The Telegraph has a really terse essay on the actual missiles that the Houthis have. And what I read out of it is this is, I, I see the stereotype in the media that this is a bunch of terrorists off on a desert island. That's not the case. They have very sophisticated missiles. For example, the USS Gravely's there, the Arleigh Burke uh, destroyer, and they've got some missiles here of real capability, including ASBMs. Do we underestimate their sophistication? No. And in fact, it's a uh, well-known fact among the governments of the region and Europe that the Houthis have acquired uh, powerful missiles and, and more importantly, training from Iran and in Iran on those missiles to make them a, a lethal uh, a threat to the region. What is the difference for our ships at sea, at the Red Sea, and frankly outside the Red Sea today? Now that this attack has occurred by the Allies, what's the new risk to our sailors? Well, the Houthis are certainly going to sit back and say, what do they have left? What has been damaged? How can they disperse and use other tools? We have to remember the Houthis still have a vast drone fleet, probably some missile capacity of uh, drone boats uh, and uh, also naval mines. Now, a naval facility was struck as part of the attack uh, profile, but that doesn't mean that we have taken out all of those capabilities. And the Houthis, again, can use those as long as they keep the nature of the attacks below the level that would cause a very significant counter-strike. Norman, this effort has been led by the United States and the United Kingdom. What do you think we can learn from the countries who were involved and the countries who weren't? Well, the United States and the United Kingdom, as usual, are very close partners, and their intelligence and military authorities would have coordinated very closely over the weeks prior to this. Within the region, we had support from involvement by Bahrain and the European Union from Netherlands. That doesn't mean these other countries weren't playing different roles for security in the region, but, but for their own political and security reasons, they could not involve themselves in the attack. And frankly, the United States and the United Kingdom had more than enough ordinance to undertake the exact activities between our missiles, the U.S. submarine, and the four typhoons launched from Cyprus. Can you take us into Riyadh and give us a deeper understanding of how Saudi Arabia will be thinking about this moment? Saudi Arabia has issued a muted response calling for restraint from all parties. Uh, the Saudis will probably be pushing a diplomatic initiative to send deterrent messages to the Houthis and to the Iranians. Uh, I'm not sure the impact of that, but the Saudis also have to recognize that if the conflict were to escalate, it would impact their uh, security issues, and the international community has not shown much appetite for uh, working against uh, Yemen in the long term. So they have to be careful. If you're going to involve yourself in Yemen, what's the plan? How does this end? And are you going to be with us as long as it takes? And the United States right. and Europe have not demonstrated that interest. Norman Rule, Bahrain near Qatar 
sandwiched between Kuwait to the north and UAE, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi to the south at the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea, I should say. Uh, the, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at Bahrain. What is their relationship to the other Arab states? Are they alone this morning, or are they acting in support, uh, with, with su the support, I should say, of the other Arab nations? Well, there's no opposition to Bahrain's activities. Bahrain is not the largest country in the region, but it consistently shows significant leadership on issues ranging from the Abraham Accords, on opposing what Hamas did on October 7th, and on its support with uh, allied and partner military activities. Uh, the Naval Nav Cent, our Naval Command Center in the region, is located in Manama, and the Bahraini leadership is, is a very supportive and reliable partner. What is the level of our intelligence this morning? You've been so good at outlining to us how we know what we know. That's always the worry. Do we have good intelligence after these attacks? The nature of the attacks demonstrates a clear and uh, uh, good understanding of the locations from which attacks have taken place. Uh, we have infrared satellite capability that, according to press reports, allows us to understand uh, whence attacks originate. So I'm confident that the intelligence behind these attacks and subsequent Houthi operations will be good and consistent with the past. I'd love your interpretation of a headline we got in the last hour or so, Norman. I wonder what you think about this. When you you hear the Houthis say that all US-UK interests are now legitimate targets. Norman, what does that mean? Well, Houthi rhetoric and Iranian rhetoric will remain defiant and strong, but again, we're likely to see Houthi attacks against shipping in the in their neighborhood. Their reach uh, is really not far beyond that. Uh, but again, the Houthis are going to want to calibrate this uh, for their own domestic audience and for the region as they move forward without, again, in, getting another major missile response, particularly one aimed at their leadership. This response was tactical in deterring and degrading activity. It was not strategic. It was not aimed at leadership or destroying all Houthi military assets. And again, we're managing that escalatory ladder, and the administration in London are doing this carefully. The administration and Westminster will have to manage the domestic reaction as well. Norman, this came from Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister. Described the hits on Yemen as limited, necessary, and proportionate after weeks of dangerous and destabilizing attacks. The electorate, and I think domestically within the United States, within the UK, are going to be increasingly worried about their countries, their nations being drawn into this tension in the Middle East. Norman, would you describe what we saw overnight through this morning as a one-off, or are we setting the stage for a repeat of this through the next few weeks? The British Prime Minister's statement is accurate and, care and crisply uh, said. Uh, we hope it's a one-off, but that's really up to the Houthis. I think what we have to look at is whether a Houthi counter strike will be uh, symbolic, uh, meant to show defiance, or really something that indicates that they haven't got the message. If the latter is the case, there will certainly be a, a broader strike by the United States, probably the United Kingdom. But again, it'll be carefully calibrated to move up the escalatory ladder. Neither Washington or London are interested in an all-out conflict in the region. And, Norman, and Iran and who know this. At the moment, you're comfortable that there is some kind of distinction between Iran and Houthi rebels, because a lot of people struggle with that idea. You will note that in the U.S. statement on the attack, Iran is not mentioned, although in any explanation of the uh, attack and the problem set, Iran is always described as being behind this activity. Iran will attempt with difficulty to deliver new weapons and provide support to the Houthis, but the naval capacity in the region will likely disrupt that. I think the broader problem is going to be the capacity of Iran's embassy and the people involved to provide intelligence and counsel to the Houthis as they deliberate their way forward, but that's the nature of the relationship relationship between Iran and the Houthis. Norman, we're very lucky to catch up with you, sir. Thanks for your time. Norman Rule there of CSIS. We are going to turn now to Mohammed uh, L. Aryan at Queen's College, Cambridge, and it is on economics, finance, and investment. But today it's on something different. After the attacks we saw overnight against uh, Houthi uh, rebels and terrorists and, of course, their relationship to Iran. Mohammed, this goes back to Albert Harani and what we all learned about the history of the Arab people. Bahrain is one of our allies here. Would you suggest that the Arab nations are in support of this allied attack on these rebels? 
I would suggest they're nervous. You saw a statement by Saudi Arabia that is warning against escalation. And the concern here, Tom, is that other proxies, other Iranian proxies in the Middle East will see this as a reason to um, escalate what's going on in that region. So that's why you hear concern from the, the Arab countries. The last thing anybody wants is an escalation that becomes region-wide. Which institution can create a dialogue between Tehran and a Western world worried? I think first you, you need to see a cessation of hostilities in Gaza. That, that is a precondition. There, there, there won't be the ability to get people talking um, in a broader sense in the region until you get a cessation of hostilities in Gaza. Once you get that, then you know that the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran has improved. You know that the, the UEE um, plays a, a critical role in, in conversations among countries in the region. So, so there are parties that can help, but you need the precondition first. Mohammed, you warned in Project Syndicate recently not to extrapolate out the favorable trends that we finished last year with. Is there something that's developing in the Middle East right now that you think is a direct threat to that? It's one of the things, John. I mean, my major concern is that if you look at the three systemically important regions in the world, um, economically, the Eurozone, the US and China, all three are having issues growing in a robust manner. The US is the exception there, but even the US now is facing lower household savings, higher debt. China needs to fundamentally change its economic models. And we know that without a healthy Germany, Europe is going to struggle. So if you actually look at who is the locomotive of growth, it's very hard to point to one locomotive. Um, it's hard to believe that the U.S. will be able to maintain what was very impressive growth rates. Now, put on top of that, the geopolitical concerns, and that's why this recency bias where people simply extrapolate what was a surprisingly good year from last year is something that we have to guard against. So you're questioning the resilient growth story. Are you also questioning the disinflationary trends, Mohammed, that have started to develop over the last 12 months? Yeah, I smiled when I heard the conversation before I came on that, you know, it's disinflation ahead. It's not. We're going to see and we already are seeing cost push pressures in the pipeline. There's two in particular. What's happened to nav navigation in the Red Sea is directly and indirectly increasing inflationary pressures, directly by hiking input prices, indirectly by causing shortages that then influence other prices. And then we have the labor market issue. We have higher labor costs coming through the pipeline. So you've got cost push pressures coming in. <coughs> I suspect we will see inflation at the CPI level get stuck at 3%. And then the Fed is going to have to make a difficult decision, either tolerate it for longer. And I was encouraged by John Williams' use of the word, a longer term inflation target is 2%, or try to reduce it to 2% too quickly and risk um, the real economy. But this notion that immaculate disinflation is going to continue is something that I find very hard to reconcile with actual data. Mohammed, you really challenge that theory. I think that we get a lot of people on this program, and I know you tune in and you've heard them say it, that the economy is rebalancing, this will continue, just give it time, we'll get there. You push back against that. I hear other people say things haven't changed. We will go back to the pre-2020 economic <clears throat> regime, low and stable inflation, growth in at around 2%. Do you really believe something has changed? What are the issues that you can point to, Mohammed, that you think have fundamentally changed since the pandemic? So, so I think it has fundamentally changed since um, what, what was before the pandemic. Coming out of the global financial crisis, we had major balance sheet damage, and that resulted in a decade of insufficient aggregate demand. There simply wasn't enough demand in the system. And when there isn't enough demand in the system, you pump in liquidity from the monetary side, from the fiscal side, and you don't have to worry about inflation. You boost up asset prices, 
and you get some growth response, but nothing really exciting. That was the story before the pandemic. Coming out of the pandemic, in addition, well in addition to the pandemic disruptions, we have four factors that are leading to insufficient aggregate supply. So it's a fundamental change in the macro environment. So what are those factors? We have fragmenting globalization, which means that supply chains are starting to be determined by geopolitical and not just commercial um, uh, reason. We have companies themselves looking for more resilience balance sheets, uh, more resilient supply chains after what happened during the pandemic. We have a significant transition on climate. And we have the labor market also, where labor force participation has not gone up as much as all of us wish. This is a world in which we are fragile to begin with on the supply side, and then right. you get the original shock. So that is a fundamental change. Uh, Mohammed, I'm not going to be at Davos. I'm going to be watching QPR at Watford this weekend. Really looking forward uh, to that. <laughs> Mohammed's but, not. <laughs> you know, my, I'm sorry, but I'll be there. Mohammed, if I was in Davos, my banner for the year would be it's cost of carry Davos. What's fundamentally changed off of your good analysis there moments ago is all of a sudden money costs something. Every single business and family out there has a new cost of money. How's our world going to change a year out with this new new after the free lunch of the last decade? Yeah, and, and the issue is, is the legacy of the free lunch. I think on a flow basis, we can deal with the higher cost of money. The problem is the stock. And, and we know there are three major areas that somehow have to be refinanced, and you've got to get volume back. One is the U.S. housing market where the higher, the higher mortgage rate is just stopping people from moving. And it's very hard to get into, onto the housing ladder right now because you're not getting the flow you need. Second is commercial real estate. There's a trillion plus that has to be refinanced and some of it cannot be refinanced at what is assumed in terms of value. And then the third area that needs to do is we have a wall of corporate maturities coming up in 2025 and companies normally try to get ahead of it. So if we can deal with the stock issue, with the legacy of this borrowing that occurred when rates were artificially low, we can deal with the flow aspect. The flow aspects, Tom, don't worry me. We just have to deal with the stock. Mohammed, we'll continue this conversation. Do you want to tell Tom about QPR or should I? No, I, I really don't want to get depressed and start crying on Relegation yourself. zone, TK. Really? Relegation zone. Can the Jets be relegated? I mean, they are uh, like the Jets of English football in the championship really? right now. Yeah, not there's, And there's a level below them. They can go down a league, yeah. This is not looking good for QPR. Well, you know, Mr. Rubenstein's rumored to be looking into Baltimore Orioles. I think I keep Professor, saying to Mohammed, I've said Professor to Mohammed, Alarian, I mean, if, come on. If they get relegated, can we get some kind of consortium together and take out QPR. Yeah, that's what I, you know, get some movie I actor that involved that watches us every day. That'd be you know, great. Mohammed's in the and UK And you could do now. the Ted Lasso thing. You could sure, go over and do it. I could go it. and coach the team or coach, something. I'm not sure it. anyone at QPR wants that. I'm not sure QPR wants <laughs> that. I know Mohammed Alarian doesn't that want either. that. either. The brilliant Mohammed Alarian of Queen's College, Cambridge. The NFL reporting its best rating since 2010. 93 of the top 100 TV broadcasts last year NFL games. And it's not just YouTube. Peacock getting involved this weekend, set to broadcast their first playoff game, the NFL signaling a shift away from linear TV. Michael Nathanson and Moffat Nathanson weighing in, writing, quote, where the history of linear TV has been written, a sad and sorry chapter will be dedicated to how such a once great business was supplanted by a model that wasn't nearly as good for anyone. Michael, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Michael, great to catch up with you, sir. Let's discuss it. Let's talk about the sport itself, the dominance of football in this country. What's everyone else getting wrong? American football. Yeah, American football. Whatever else, whatever, whatever else is getting wrong, it, it's a perfect sport for a TV, right? You have you know, a set of games, very predictable every week. It's a short season. Every game matters. And sports gambling is is growing very quickly. So it's a combination of it's it's easy to watch. You can bet on it. And we have national storylines, right? The teams are now nationally right. followed in a way that when 
Tom and I were younger, that wasn't the case. It was a regional sport, but now it's national in terms of fandom. Mike, I was watching Digiday, reading Digiday, I should say, about the complete total dominance of Mr. Moen's YouTube. And I'm absolutely fed. You've been so far out front on this with Craig Moffat. Is anybody down the road going to compete with the two consolidated giants, YouTube and Netflix? Amazon. So it's interesting. You know, people have always said content is king. I think the past decade, what, it's, what's, what we see now is the platform is king. And I put Amazon, Netflix, and YouTube as the future leaders in this industry, right. current leaders in the future. And the challenge for media companies is how do you play in that world, right? How does your content resonate in a world where you have these massive platforms with so much choice? And this is this is the challenge of next next decade. Michael, we got to make some news here, so let's get to it. It's a Friday. We need okay. Nathan some news right now. Paul Sweeney modeled out yesterday uh, the idea of ESPN with a forty percent lift, I believe, in expense they have to pay for all this uh, sporting activity. Is Mr. Iger setting up ESPN for an immediate sale to Amazon? You know, he has floated the idea of finding minority partners. I don't think he wants to give it up at this point in time. Um, he's floated partners from the platforms, from the leagues, maybe some other third parties. I think Disney wants to be in the sports business, and they just want to find some funding to help them get through. We have wondered for a while now how ESPN is a better business going forward than it's been. Costs are rising. Yeah. Court cutting continues to slide. <laughs> So we've been writing lately, and we'll talk about this a couple of weeks ago, Tom, with you, is that we think streaming, and they've not had a good streaming run here, but they need to focus more energy on streaming and less on ESPN. And we'll see if they listen I mean, to this, us. John, but, but, you know. This to me is like the interview of the year, John. It was Daniel Levy and you in <laughs> London. Yeah. And at the end of that interview, I was standing there, folks, off the side having a, a pre-cocktail tang. And the answer is, John, is he said, well, we just we don't really want to win. We just sort of want to compete and have a good Entertain. entertainment. I'm not hearing that from Nathan Center. Iger, it's totally different over here about winning. Let's talk about the sport. Michael, yep. how do you break it? I think you break it by airing playoff games on streaming platforms that people don't have. I asked my producer, Jamie, this morning. Simple question. Do you have a producer? Jamie. I don't Jamie's have fantastic. One. How come you have you don't one? get to don't share it. I turned to Jamie Michael and I said, How do you watch the football? When's it on? And he gave me an answer immediately. I said, How do you watch the baseball? When's it on? Couldn't answer the question. He's a basketball fan. I said, When's the basketball on? How do you watch it? Couldn't answer the question with a direct answer. That's the problem for all these other sports. And a great example of that is boxing. They have killed boxing. This used to be something everyone used to watch together. It's not anymore. It's buried on a streaming platform, whatever it's called. I don't know. I like boxing and I don't pay to watch it. Michael, are they about to break it? You talked about the loss of the experience and I'm with you. They're killing it. They've got success. Are they about to break it? Yeah, John, I'll break news on the air with you. I totally agree with you. It makes me so angry as a consumer and an analyst that the, this is one of, this playoff game is probably the top game of the weekend, right? And when I got the, when I saw the schedule when, when it came out, I'm like, wait, they're putting they're putting the Dolphins Chiefs on Peacock, so we have to pay six bucks more a month to get it for one night. That's just in, outrageous to me, right? It just is, and I I think it's greedy, and yeah, you know, I know why Comcast is doing it in Peacock. I think the league is is overreaching here, and they've done an amazing job navigating the entire fragmentation of media. But I think you're right, John. I think there's a, a feedback loop which says, these guys don't care about the fans. They're in it for the money. And it's just loud and clear by having the best game of the weekend on Peacock. And I totally agree with you. Michael, is this because the angry. numbers simply don't work? I've heard TV executives talk about this. The problem with sport is that you build out the asset, but you never own it. You have to lease it. You get a four or five year deal. I just wonder whether the numbers really work anymore. It was always about grabbing that appointment of view. There were very few left. Let's go to sports. Live TV, all that's left is sports and this right here, broadcast news. Michael, I just wonder the future of that, given how much the asset now costs. Well, it's interesting, John. Um, when you're 90 to 100 million homes in America, it was a great model. But as homes start to slide, the cost of sport keeps going up and the cost of rev and the revenues keep coming down or flattening. So it doesn't work for every sport. The NFL yeah. is key because for five months out of the year, it maintains the pay TV bundle. 
that is the different sport, right? right? Hockey, as much as I love hockey, is small. Baseball's become you know a small sport in America, but the NFL and college football are different. I think those two models hold right. for the time being. For the time being, right? They hold. Michael, you and Craig Moffat on the high ground on predicting that we would cut the cord. I'm going to give credit also to your good competitor, Rich Greenfield, for being out front on this as well. I want to talk about the new cord cutting, which is the churn. Model a 6% churn and what that means for finance of our entertainment. To me, that's a ginormous number because I think over 36 months of business plan, that you lose 18% of your people. Am I right? Well, yeah, the, you know, Tom, the churn is actually 6% a month for some of these services. So think about that, right? So in, you know, over a couple of years, let's say a year and a half, you can churn your entire base out. The streaming model does not work as built today. That's where you're seeing all these bundles come together because, as and Craig, Craig's been on this from day one, there was nothing better, I mean, 20 years ago, there was nothing better than the pay TV bundle because you don't have to compete uh, for customers, the customer is given to you by the cable operator. You just had to make one good show a quarter to get paid by the cable operator. In this world, you need a constant, constant hit cycle, and it's impossible to do. So it churns off the charts. The model, you know, Netflix has surprised me. We've been a bit of a doubter on Netflix's model, but it's just worked their way so well. The number two position is not very pretty. If you look at Disney in terms of the economics, they lost two and a half billion dollars right. last year. You need to cut churn, and the only way you cut churn right. is by bundling with other people or seeing competitors now, die. That's that's where we are. I know your single best buy is the New York Yankees with Juan Soto. What a gift that is! <laughs> but in the finance, in the stock market, Michael Nathanson, what's your single best buy right now? Well, it's funny. Our single best buy is actually a short call on Roku. So, like you know, we've been push. We've been very, very aggressive on Meta and Alphabet the past fifteen months. So we still like them, but it's getting harder and harder to see the, you know, it was a home run a year ago. We were saying that in media, we've been buying Disney, but for Disney, I feel like the pressure is on them to now prove, prove the case for streaming. Right. So, so our best call is shorting Roku here, which is, you know, a, a call on the state of streaming, right? That's, that's our, the call of the year. We do this every six months. We update our call today for me, it's Roku on the, on the sell side. Love this. Michael, let's do this again soon. Michael Nathanson okay. there of Muffet Nathanson. Thank you, buddy. Subscribe to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live every weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can watch us live on Bloomberg Television and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Keen, and this is Bloomberg.